Hi, this is IB ESS Topic 9, Pollution and Waste. Um, now, if you look in your textbook uh, or your ESS guides, you will find that there is no Topic 9. Um, there's only eight topics in ESS. Topic 9 is a um, Mr. Carden invention. I'm very proud of it. Um, there's three subtopics in our made-up Topic 9. Um, humans and pollution, which is within Topic 1 water pollution which is in topic four and solid domestic waste which is a fancy word for trash um, in 8.3 um, because these are pretty similar um, in terms of the the causes and the effects or using systems terminology of the the inputs and the outputs um, i think it makes more sense to learn these together uh, so this is a again a, a made-up topic um, but I think you'll find that it makes more sense to learn these three things um, uh, in sync with one another. So we'll start with uh, topic 1.5, which is basically a, a broader view um, or an introduction to things we'll get into more depth in um, 8.3 and 1.4, but humans and pollution. So the first thing that's important to recognize is that pollution can be natural. Um, a great example of natural pollution is a volcanic eruption. So a volcanic eruption is not human caused, it's not anthropogenic, um, and it can cause a lot of harm to the environment, um, both short term and long term. Um, and then obviously most pollution is human caused, whether it is uh, deliberate or accidental. Um, it's really on the surface defined as anything that harms the environment. Um, and so when you think of, of harm to the environment, look at these two pictures at the bottom, um, the picture on the right is absolutely harmful for the environment, so absolutely pollution. Um, now on the left, we see a Coke can that got thrown in a field. Um, is that harming the environment? Is it leaching toxins into the soil? I don't think so. Um, is it causing an animal harm? Well, currently no. And so I would argue that on the left, that might be litter and it might be unsightly, but I don't know if it would, cons if it would be uh, considered pollution. Um, the next bullet, uh, in terms of harm for the environment, just think of it as the input is greater than the output. Um, so if we're just thinking of trash and litter, um, if, if humans are dropping one bag of fast food on the ground and then picking another bag of fast food up, it wouldn't really be considered pollution because it's a, a net zero of, of harm to the environment. Um, now, obviously, if we're dropping bags of fast food into the environment and not picking any up, now the input is at a greater rate than the output, and so that would be considered pollution. Um, and we already answered this question about uh, my opinion is that on the right, wait, is that your right? Yeah, that should be your right. Uh, the, the hedgehog stuck in the six pack holder is uh, pollution, and I think the Coke can is litter. I'm sure you could argue uh, other way uh, as well. Another interesting perspective, invasive species. So um, organisms that um, are living in a place that they are not naturally found, usually because humans brought them there, they might push out native species, they might um, outcompete native species. So would, do we consider that a type of pollution? Um, Based on the IB definition, I guess that it is, um, although we don't often consider living things to be a type of pollution. Uh, another thing to think about is that um, pollutants can have benefits. Um, and a great example of this is DDT. Um, so just a little bit about DDT, you should have read about um, Rachel Carson's book during our last project. But in the 1950s, DDT was, was really popular and it was a great insecticide. Um, we sprayed it on our crops, we sprayed it uh, in, around the neighborhoods in the summertime, and um, it, it was great. Um, Rachel Carson then uh, took it upon herself when she realized that uh, populations of birds around the country had dropped, um, came out with the, the environmental effects of DDT in her novel Silent Spring. Um, later on, health effects of humans were realized, like, like cancers and infertility. And so it was banned um, by the, the World Health Organization uh, in 1970. So who banned them? Get it? Who banned them? Who? Okay, sorry. Um, but going forward to today, malaria kills millions of people a year. Um, because of that, uh, the World Health Organization um, 
exempted DDT from that ban. And in LEDCs, so countries that don't have um, uh, the the means, the technology, or the or the money for um, organic pesticides or um, a, ways to protect crops without hurting humans. Um, they're using DDT again. And it's an interesting uh, dilemma because on the one hand, uh, DDT is really bad. It's nasty stuff. It, it kills, it hurts humans. Um, it kills birds. Um, there's evidence that it can lead to death in humans. But on the other hand, um, malaria is probably worse. And so the fact that malaria kills millions of people a year, mostly in very poor countries, mostly in um, tropical sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, um, doesn't it make sense for them to use DDT if there is no um, no other option? So that's an interesting, um, interesting arguments on both sides there as well. Um, okay, there's four sources of pollution. So this is definitely something we need to know within the content of this unit. Um, first of all, industrial uh, pollution. So this would be things like toxic metal, metals, um, toxic chemicals, heavy metals. Um, heat is a, is a type of industrial pollution, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, waste from agriculture, so salinization, which is basically um, salt leaching into waterways, uh, pesticides, fertilizers, um, animal waste is a big one, especially in feedlots where you have um, up to hundreds of thousands of pigs or cattle or chickens in one place. And so that's a lot of poop um, that, again, naturally, we don't consider poop, especially from wild animals, um, to be pollution. But when you have a 10,000 pigs together, um, all that poop needs to go somewhere. And that's absolutely a type of pollutant because that can cause lots of environmental harm. Um, domestic waste, so domestic means like from our houses. Um, so our sewage, our trash, trash e-waste, which is a term for electronic waste and food, of course. Uh, last but not least, fossil fuel combustion. Um, so this puts a lot of gases into the atmosphere. Um, most noteworthy are GHGs, which is short for greenhouse gases, um, the, the number one cause for climate change. Um, the main greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide and methane. Um, we'll get into those more in depth. Now, besides the four sources of pollution, there are six types of pollution. Now, make sure that you uh, see the, the differences between those two. Um, the source of pollution refers to where it comes from. Does it come from a farm? Does it come from a factory? Does it come from our house? Um, whereas the type of pollution is what is the actual pollutant? So we have air pollutants, we have water pollutants, we have land pollutants, and then we have noise, light, and thermal pollutants. Um, so first of all, we're gonna get into air pollutants um, much more in depth at a later time. Uh, water pollutants we'll get into at the end of this topic. Uh, land pollutants we'll also get into next topic. Um, but take a second and think about noise, light, and thermal pollution. Thermal meaning heat. Um, how are those things pollution? Um, why? So if you look at this picture of uh, the city on the right, um, it's creating light and there's a lot of noise from the city. How are things like that considered pollution? So pause the video, take a second to think about that. Um, examples of noise pollution, uh, disturbing animals. So animals that live near um, highways or trains or airports um, are often disturbed by noises. Um, in people, uh, it can lead to things like anxiety, depression, insomnia, rage. Um, and so that is something that's absolutely harmful. And so therefore it falls into the category of a pollutant. Um, a lot of animals that uh, rely on mating calls, um, so audio based um, courtship, uh, they can't find each other. So the male frogs or birds that are trying to attract females are getting drowned out by um, uh, industrial noises or highway noises. And so it's, it's obviously harmful. Uh, trees, as you'll find for a lot of the issues in this class, are a solution to noise pollution. Trees absorb sound. So if you live next to a highway or next to an airport, plant trees because trees will actually act as like um, insulation. They'll absorb the noise um, to make our world a little quieter. Uh, light pollution, a big issue here is that migrating birds can't navigate around city lights. Um, whales, uh, which scientists aren't totally sure how, how whales and birds migrate. Um, there's some evidence that they might use magnetic clues, but also evidence that they use light clues from, from different stars. Um, but anyways, uh, whales 
end up beaching themselves because of light pollution. And so that makes us believe that they use some sort of star navigation for their um, uh, migration, which is pretty interesting. Um, there's also a, a theory about bird migration, sorry, off topic, but um, birds have these, these types of cells in their brain that have like little specks of magnetic iron in it. And so they get that magnetic iron from somewhere in their diet. And then within that cell, which is like, aqueous water-based the magnetic iron will like float towards the north end of the cell because it's um magnetically attracted to the north pole um and so anyways that's one theory on how birds may navigate to some degree um and then also the aesthetic loss of light pollution um because we don't have pretty stars to look at um so obviously i would say you know you could argue that's harmful and then thermal pollution heat pollution the biggest um issue here is it might destroy habitats for um, cold water fish. So if there's a power plant on a river and that river is normally 55 degrees, means that the species that live in that river have evolved to live in 55 degree water. And if the power plant is um, pumping a lot of heat into the river, and now that river is 65 degrees, um, it means that species may be going extinct um, due to not being able to handle the, um, the new environment. Um, it's important to recognize that thermal pollution is not a cause of climate change. So heat coming from our houses, heat coming from a factory, um, that like heat on a global scale is pretty much um, minimized to zero. It's on the local scale of warming up a river or warming up a local area that could cause damage. In terms of climate change, it's the gases we emit, CO2 and methane, that trap heat from the sun and lead to warmer climate. Okay, a little bit uh, more vocab. Um, we got eight terms and, and the good news is of these eight terms, uh, there's four that are opposites of another four. So if you can use context clues and look at the contrast or the difference between the two terms, I think it'll be like learning four vocab words instead of eight vocab words. So take a second to pause the video um, and take your best guess on um, the differences between these contrasting pollution terms. Okay, so I will go ahead and make a table with um, the terms, the differentiation, which is basically the two definitions. And then um, if you can jot down a note on how to remember, so it could be a mnemonic device, it could be just um, thinking of like the the using common sense and think about the root of the word but um leave a little area on the right so you can so you can write down how to learn and memorize these terms okay so the first one persistent versus biodegradable my guess is you know the term biodegradable um, those are things that can deteriorate back into the earth um, so anything that can easily and quickly break down into soil is considered biodegradable um, the opposite of that is persistent. Um, something like plastic or certain metals, they're not going to degrade back into soil on any uh, fat in, in any reasonable time frame. It might be hundreds of thousands of years for them to degrade. Um, so we consider things like those um, persistent. So obviously between these two, biodegradable pollution is going to be um, better than persistent pollution. Okay, next, acute versus chronic. Maybe you've heard this in terms of like medical or, or injuries. Um, so for example, I have a chronic bad shoulder. That means that um, over time, like for years and years, my shoulder just always seems to give me problems. It always just hurts a little bit. Um, last year I sprained my ankle and my ankle really hurt for a month and then it got better, that would be an acute injury because it was like um, something that happened uh, quickly. It really hurt, I couldn't walk, and then I kind of got over it. Same thing with uh, pollution terms. So acute pollution would be something like um, a oil tanker crashes into an iceberg and spills a million gallons of oil. That's an example of uh, a major acute pollution issue. Um, chronic pollution would be a um, oil pipeline that has a leak and um, a gallon of oil is leaking into the environment every week and uh, that goes on for a, for a year, which is 52 gallons of oil leaking into the environment. So that would be an example of chronic pollution. Primary secondary. Primary pollution is emitted directly from a source 
secondary pollution goes through some sort of transformation in the atmosphere um, and it the pollutant is actually a little different than what came from the source so a great example of a primary pollutant is carbon monoxide it comes straight out of the tailpipe of our car um, it's a deadly gas if we breathe it in um, it literally carbon monoxide is what leaves the tailpipe um, other stuff comes out of the tailpipe of our car like uh, nitrous oxides and if nitrous oxide mixes with water it turns into nitric acid which is a uh, cause for acid rain if nitric oxide mixes um, with sunlight and this in sunlight dis disassociates the uh, oxygen atoms it can create ozone or O3 which is again a, another pollutant but both those pollutants ozone and nitric acid um, are secondary pollutants because they're created um, after the pollutant gets into the environment okay then last but not least point versus non-point um, I'd say this is probably the easiest point pollution has a identifiable source non-point pollution has a non-identifiable source um, think of this point pollution you can point to it if there's a factory that's leaking toxins into the river you can point to that factory and say look right there that's where the toxins are coming out into the river um, if we're talking about fertilizer runoff in the Mississippi River the Mississippi River is filled with fertilizer that causes all sorts of problem where did it come from well it came from one of the thousands of farms along the Mississippi River somewhere in Ohio somewhere in Wisconsin um, somewhere in Missouri uh, there's there's too many uh, possibilities um, think about all the runoff from a highway so antifreeze that's leaking from a highway into a river um, it's coming from a bunch of cars and, and there's no real easy way to know where so that would be non-point pollution um, example of persistent organic pollutants or POPs um, anything that doesn't break down easily so um, DDT is an example of a POP a lot of pesticides um, PCBs and dioxins which are found in plastic um, things that get in your body that your body can't really break down so think about alcohol alcohol is a um, definitely a, a pollutant to your body it's harmful um, but your liver breaks it down um, you, your body has ways to basically get rid of it and then um, after consuming alcohol your body can basically recover um, a lot of these persistent, persistent pollutants are stored in our fat cells um, our fat cells really don't go anywhere like even when we if you lose weight you don't have less fat cells your fat cells just get smaller um, and so basically um, they're going to be stored in that in those fat cells and we'll have them in our bodies forever um, diagram looking at the health effects of pollution and again whether it's coming from air pollution water pollution contaminants in soil like pesticides herbicides um, they can lead to all sorts of things most air pollutants are going to cause respiratory issues um, whereas uh, water pollutants can end up with um, gastro enter gastroenterological gastroenter huh stomach based issues uh, but anyways um, and then of course those POPs um, and things that get stored in our fat cells they can cause a lot of brain and developmental issues okay so a car releases a little bit of carbon monoxide and VOCs which are volatile organic compounds every time you drive that's chronic a factory explosion in Bhopal India releases millions of pounds of toxic chemicals at one time remember you learned about that in our um, uh, environmental history that's an example of acute pollution um, measuring pollution uh, comes up in 1.5 but it comes up in more depth in one point I'm sorry in 4.4 the main thing though the main difference is, is that there are direct ways to measure pollution and indirect ways to measure pollution so for example if you put a pH meter in a river and you read that the pH is acidic that's a direct measure that there's acid in that river um, an indirect measure a great one would be species diversity if you catch a bunch of wild animals in a river and you find um, a lot of diversity it's a indirect measure that you're in a healthy environment um, if you only catch one or two species and there's species that are um, that are um, able to survive in polluted areas they're pollution tolerant creatures um, it's very likely a, a non-healthy environment okay and then the most important part of this topic um, the three levels of pollution management 
Um, so if there's anything that you stop and, and look up or uh, write down three times in a row because you want to remember it, it should be this. Um, this is going to come up in those other two units. It comes up in 8.3, it comes up in 4.4, and really throughout this course, um, because we're always thinking about uh, the, the harm we do to the environment and then the ways to mitigate or deal with that pollution. Okay, level one is prevention, level two is reduction, and level three is restoration. So we're gonna go through each one of these levels. There's um, benefits and drawbacks to each. Okay, so level one um, is just changing a human activity that's creating the pollution. Um, so carbon monoxide coming out of our tailpipes, um, stop driving cars. Um, Coal is being burned and it's creating sulfur dioxide and leading to sulfuric acid. Um, stop burning coal. Um, for example, switch to solar panels. Um, stop living in a throwaway society. So instead of um, selling and manufacturing um, styrofoam cups, it's just stop doing it. We just prevent it. We, we no longer have them for sale. That would be an example of a level one uh, prevention. Um, obviously, the change here needs to be active because it's it's something that needs to happen preemptively um, to prevent a change or prevent pollution. And that can be tough because um, we don't really think of maybe styrofoam cups as a source of pollution until our earth is filled with styrofoam cups. Um, so you need to really think ahead and think, you know what, we should man these styrofoam cups before the earth is filled with them. Um, education is obviously a big part of actively creating change. Legislation can be a part of that. And then of course, economic incentives. So um, uh, paying uh, customer, giving customers an incentive to bring their own cup to a restaurant. And during a pandemic, that's probably not a great idea, but um, uh, during non-COVID times, um, some sort of incentive for companies or consumers to just act in ways that are um, more sustainable. Okay, level two is the reduction of releasing the pollutant. So basically anything that doesn't necessarily eliminate an environmental harmful activity, but something that makes that environmentally harmful activity less harmful. Um, again, regulations and legislation here can be examples. So we think of like EPA regulations, a car built in the year 2020 has to get a certain amount of miles per gallon of fuel efficiency. Obviously, those cars are still polluting because they're burning uh, gasoline, um, but those fuel regulations make it so that the act of burning through gasoline is less harmful than uh, an older car. Um, another example would be a technology that can extract pollutants. So let's say we decide we're still going to um, use coal-powered uh, coal -powered power plants. Um, we can attach these things on these smokestacks called scrubbers. And a scrubber does exactly what it sounds like. It basically scrubs and catches a lot of the pollutants that normally would leave the smokestack and end up in the atmosphere. The scrubber basically catches them and turns them into like a slurry, like a watery, powdery mixture. Um, and then we can bury that slurry into the earth and keep a lot of those um, pollutants out of the atmosphere. Then last but not least, level three, um, restore or remediate. So these terms are pretty similar. Um, restoration or remediation both mean to like to fix and return to its prior self. Um, this is a last resort because obviously it would be better to um, reduce the pollution in the first place or not have pollution at all. Um, but basically what we mean by restore or remediate is removing the pollutant. So think about that BP oil spill back in 2009. Um, you guys are probably a bit young when this issue occurred, but um, tons of oil leaked uh, into the Gulf of Mexico because of a um, explosion at a deep water oil rig. Um, and so that's definitely a level three issue where there's still ongoing cleanup because of uh, that disaster. Um, you can replant and restock depleted populations. So let's say we uh, cause a lot of acid rain and a forest dies, uh, we can plant new trees uh, as part of uh, trying to remediate or restore that forest. Um, and this is the most expensive of the three. As humans, though, we tend to think retroactively. It saves us some money in the front, um, but then on the back end, we end up dealing with a lot of uh, 
of aftermath. So going back to that BP oil spill, um, BP probably spent millions and millions of dollars cleaning up the oil. Um, they probably could have prevented it with um, a tenth of that in terms of preemptive safety measures and just having better equipment or better uh, uh, checking, you know, better uh, precautions. Um, but it seems like a waste of money. Why would we spend money to constantly check our oil rigs for um, compliance when there's a good chance we don't have to? But then uh, we end up with millions of oil, of gallons of oil in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and uh, we end up spending a lot more money uh, restoring. A couple types of remediation. So going into more detail on level three, groundwater remediation. This is when um, you take polluted groundwater out of the earth. So you pump it up to the surface, um, purify it, and then put it back into the earth. Soil excavation. So this is when you remove soil, you generally burn off contaminants. You can sift through like large contaminants, but contaminants within the soil can be burned off at certain uh, temperatures. And then you put that soil back. Um, phytoremediation is when you use plants to absorb pollution out of the soil. So oftentimes there might be a, a field that has high levels of um, uh, nickel. And so you find a plant that is pretty good at absorbing nickel through its roots, and then that plant can actually phytoremediate the soil. Um, another example would be bioremediation. So here's the same concept, but we often um, genetically create uh, microbes or bacteria that are meant to digest pollutants. Um, in the last couple of years, scientists have developed like plastic eating algae and plastic eating um, bacteriums. And basically it's like small microscopic creatures that have evolved, whether naturally or synthetically, to, um, to, to get rid of pollutants. Um, now, both phytoremediation and bioremediation are really cool, um, natural, for the most part, uh, methods of restoring land. They're also very slow. Um, and so you think about the, the time it takes to um, plant a bunch of trees and allow those trees to absorb soil out of the, or uh, pollutants out of the soil. Um, that's going to take uh, years compared to soil excavation, which will probably take more money, but can happen a lot faster. Um, here's an example of uh, phytoremediation, plants built on top of an old land. Okay, uh, so five questions to wrap up this unit. I think they're pretty straightforward, but... Um, I, I would like to discuss these briefly next class. Um, so that's it for topic uh, 1.5. Jot down a couple notes um, to answer these five points, and then we will uh, discuss next class. Bye. Okay, the next subtopic of make believe topic nine is water pollution 4.4. Um, definitely going to be some um, overlap from previous topics like point and non-point pollution we go a little bit more in depth um and of course the three levels of pollution management um will be discussed. all right so just starting really generally the, the main causes of water pollution is going to be industrialization agriculture and then indirectly population growth the fact that we have um, more people on earth every year where we're approaching um eight billion people when i started teaching it was actually under 7 billion. I remember with one of, one of my first years of environmental science classes is when we hit the 7 billion mark. Um, and believe it or not, within a decade, uh, we're gonna hit 8 billion uh, around the corner soon. Um, so anyways, three uh, big, broad, holistically speaking, causes of water pollution. Um, the difference between point and non-point. Um, first of all, you should be able to answer this question. Which one is gonna be much easier to control and regulate? That is going to be point um, because obviously a point source, you can go right to the source and try to fix the dilemma where non-point pollution, because it's coming from so many different um, undiscernible places, it's really hard to, to prevent it, to regulate it, to reduce it. Um, and again, just remember you can point to point source pollution. All right, so you probably don't need to define point pollution. It's pollution that discharges from a single source. But I would add in your notes a couple examples of point source pollution, um, water that is discharged by specific like factories or industries. A waste treatment plant is going to be a source of point pollution. Um, underground storage tanks are off, often um, point source pollution. How do we prevent point source pollution? Uh, step one, identify the source. 
Step two, keep that source away from water. So if you look at that diagram, it looks pretty simple. There's like a pipe coming from, I don't know, a factory, an industry, um, dumping right into a, a waterway. Um, you could just reroute that pipe and dump it into um, maybe a, a uh, agricultural area and you wouldn't want to put waste on food that we're eating, but you could grow crops for phytoremediation where you dump the sewage, the crops are absorbing those toxins, the toxins are going to filter and um, infiltrate through the soil into the river eventually, but it's going to, um, a lot of those toxins and nasty stuff is going to get sort of drawn out of the soil and picked up by plants along the way. Okay, uh, non-point pollution, again, definition is review. Pollution that comes from many different sources and is thus hard to identify. Examples here, which you should know. Um, water runoff from streets because of all the different cars that are going to cause um, runoff events. Um, chemicals that are on our, our lawn and our crop. It's hard to discern, you know, who's using persistent um, pesticides versus who's using organic and much less harmful um fertilizers, pesticides. Um, cattle waste is, is a huge source of non-point pollution. Again, my example, the Mississippi River. Think about the thousands and thousands of feedlots along the Mississippi River. It's hard to know exactly where that waste is coming from. Um, and then think about like boats, um, oil and gas that are ending up in lakes and rivers. We don't know which boats are necessarily leaking um, oil or antifreeze. Um, I don't know if boats take antifreeze. I know nothing about boats, um, but I'm sure there's chemicals in boats that can leak into uh, waterways. So some examples that I just talked about, how do we prevent those? Again, it's, it's simpler than it may seem. Um, some things are pretty obvious, like, okay, fertilizer is a non-point source of pollution that's ending up in our rivers. Let's just use less fertilizer. Um, fertilizer is pretty cheap, so farmers just dump a lot of it on their crops. Whatever the crops can absorb just runs off into the rivers. There's really no advantage for farmers to be um, conservative with their fertilizer use because it's cheap, um, unless, of course, there's an incentive. So that's where that step two of, of uh, regulation, maybe having laws of uh, over fertilization, maybe rewards or tax breaks for farmers who are using less fertilizer. Um, keeping animals from feedlots away from uh, lakes and rivers. So again, this, this is a pretty simple solution, but if you take a look at the picture, um, we got cows that are fenced off and maybe there's a hundred yards in between the cows and the river. Um, they're still gonna be pooping. They're still gonna be, um, uh, their waste is still gonna be uh, on the farm, but it's gonna absorb, it's gonna infiltrate into the soil. It's gonna have a chance to be naturally buffered um, before it gets into the waterways. Um, again, keep things like feedlots away from slopes, uh, flood zones even, um, and, and just keep the source of pollution away from water. And that's a um, not a perfect solution, but it is definitely a beneficial solution. Uh, of course, organic farming, not using any pesticides or fertilizer or uh, uh, anything that's not organic. Okay, two more terms uh, in terms of water pollution. This will come up in our ecology unit as well. Bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Um, do me a favor and just listen to the explanations here. And um, that way um, I know that you're, you're understanding like the big picture and then you can try your best to define these in your own words. So basically as energy and biomass flow up a food chain, um, they're gonna decrease due to energy loss and inefficiencies. That's that whole second law of thermodynamics. So if you think of a trophic pyramid, you have a lot of producers and then less first level consumers, less second level consumers, even less uh, tertiary consumers. Um, and that's true with both energy and biomass. However, certain chemicals like persistent pollutants don't get metabolized like normal food or energy. Um, as I mentioned in the previous unit, they get stored in fat tissues and they just stay in the body. So what that means is that the chemicals accumulate in your body, since you're a living thing, they bioaccumulate and um, build up over time. So an example of like um, when you eat uh, fish, especially like tuna, there's a little bit of mercury in tuna. Um, if you're a pregnant woman, um, you should limit the amount of tuna that you eat. If you're um, really young or really old, you should be careful about the amount of tuna you eat. 
Um, and the reason is that they, it accumulates in your body over time. So if you eat a lot of tuna, every time you eat it, a little bit of mercury is adding up and there's more and more within your body. Um, if you think about it in terms of the food chain, the chemicals get compounded as they flow up the food chain. They, bi they biomagnify because if you think of a um, tuna, which is a top predator, that tuna probably ate a hundred smaller fish during its life. And that smaller fish probably ate uh, 50 baby shrimps throughout its life. And if there's a little bit of mercury in that baby shrimp times 50 of those in a bigger fish, and then a hundred of those get eaten by a, a tuna, we just multiply it by 5,000 and, and all that little bit of mercury is getting bigger and bigger at the top. So um, I know th this topic can be a little confusing, um, but try your best to define both bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Um, and if you need some help, I, I would think of it as bioaccumulation, um, pollutants that accumulate within the bodies of individuals, biomagnification, um, chemicals that through the process of bioaccumulation, uh, bio magnify up the food chain in a food web. Um, here's a visual where you can kind of think of bioaccumulation is within the bodies of individual over time, more and more um, persistent pollutants are being added or accumulating within their body. Whereas biomagnification, um, think about from the bottom to the top of the food chain, um, because the higher we go on the food chain, the amount of consumption is going to be like exponentially growing. Um, we're going to see a magnification of the amount of those uh, chemicals. And so it's interesting to note that um, like when you eat fish and you need to worry about uh, which fish have uh, bioaccumulated the most um, mercury, it's almost always going to be top predators. If you eat a, a lower level consumer like uh, catfish or salmon, they're going to have very, very small amounts of mercury in their body. But if you eat something like a shark or a swordfish who are top level predators, they're going to have really high amounts of mercury. Another way to look at it visually, look at the food chain, things getting smaller. But if we look at biomagnification, things are uh, exponentially growing. Okay, the next topic to discuss is eutrophication. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a bit of info about natural eutrophication, but we're much more concerned about eutrophication when it's caused by humans. Um, so looking at, again, natural eutrophication, it's when there's an increase in the amount of nutrients uh, in usually a, a aquatic uh, freshwater or saltwater ecosystem. It generally comes from nitrates. Um, some ecosystems tend to be eutrophic and others are oligotrophic. And, and again, it's, it's fairly normal. Um, if you think of the Great Lakes, Lake Superior is a very oligotrophic environment. There's very few nutrients. It's a deep, cold water lake. Um, like it's very clear. There's just not a lot of stuff floating around there. Um, lake Erie is naturally a eutrophic lake. It's um, shallow and therefore warmer. Um, there's more sunlight because it's closer to the equator. It just happens to you know, be a naturally better place for, for nutrients uh, to end up. Now, more importantly is um, when we cause uh, eutrophication. So this is called anthropogenic eutrophication. Anthropogenic is a term that will get thrown out a lot in ESS. It basically means human caused, um, but it is a more scientific way of saying human caused. Um, side note, in your writing, there's always um, mark schemes based on ES, use of ESS terminology. Um, and so although it's not wrong to say, for example, human caused climate change, um, it's just gonna sound better to say anthropogenic climate change, but something to think about. So anyways, um, this is eutrophication when it's caused by us and ultimately leads to what's called a dead zone. Um, because of humans and the actions that we do, mostly non-point pollution, um, our sewage and our excess fertilizers um, end up in, in waterways. And um, the, the phosphates and nitrates that we put on our gardens and our golf courses, um, the phosphates in our detergents, it all ends up no! in, in waterways eventually. And that is going to lead to eutrophication. Um, what happens is the algae that's naturally found in the ecosystem, they get all this excess nitrates and phosphates. And 
it is going to act as a, a fertilizer for algae because algae act very similarly to plants. It's going to lead to a, a explosion in population growth, um, just like when you, you know, fertilize your garden, it's going to lead to more growth. Um, but anyways, the algae are going to overshoot carrying capacity, meaning they, they grow too quickly, too fast, and that leads to a big mass death of algae. That algae decomposes by aerobic microbes. An aerobic microbe is something um, that's microscopic, like bacteria, that uses oxygen. So aerobic means they use oxygen. Um, so when those aerobic bacteria eat up all the dead algae, um, they use up all the oxygen. And then we get what's called um, a hypoxic environment, hypo meaning less and oxia meaning oxygen. So hypoxia is lack of oxygen, more commonly known as a death zone. Um, so I know it's a lot, but this last part is just gonna break it down step by step. Um, step one, we end up with a lot of excess fertilizer ending up in waterways, um, mostly from farms um, whether it's animal waste that's full of phosphates and nitrates or excess fertilizer that's a lot of phosphates and nitrates or even domestically like when we fertilize our lawns or um, soap gets into the environment anyways uh, that leads to step two which is a big algal bloom meaning a population explosion of algae step three the algae then has a crash because they've overshot carrying capacity step four the aerobic bacteria eat up all the algae step five well step five and step four happen at the same time when those aerobic bacteria eat up all the algae they also use up all the oxygen and then the resulting step step five or six i don't know where we're at uh dead zone or also known as hypoxia a couple examples of anthropogenic eutrophication um, on the left is the gulf of mexico um you can clearly see the the algae bloom and um the Gulf of Mexico, because that's the emptying point of the Mississippi River, um, there's huge algal blooms in, in the Gulf of Mexico um, every summer, every August. And it's because a combination of all the fertilizers that farmers throughout the Mississippi Basin have used all summer long, combination of warmer temperatures, and it leads to that big um, algal explosion and then crash. Again, here's a, a diagram of the Mississippi River Basin. So everything in that light blue area eventually drains into the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico. So think about all the feedlots, all the farms, all the golf courses in that area where all that excess fertilizer is eventually ending up in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and that's why every year we get a dead zone. Sometimes the dead zone is um, worse than others. Sometimes it's uh, toxic, like the red tide. Um, oddly enough, this is the mascot of the University of Alabama. Um, Alabama is called the Crimson Tide, which is meaning that they're named after um, toxic algae. Um, but anyways, uh, specifically, these are dinoflagellites, which is a type of, of uh, algal bloom that's toxic. Um, it, it costs millions of dollars of losses in fishing, tourism. Um, you can't go to the beach when the uh, red tide is there. Weird choice to name a sports team after. But anyways, um, just another example of eutrophication. Okay, switching topics, um, it's kind of random, uh, but just something that is in the guide we need to know is the GPGP, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, so the vast majority of our ocean pollution comes from land. Um, it all it takes is as simple as something getting into a stream or river. Streams and rivers all eventually end up at the ocean. Um, so this garbage patch is the size of Texas. And it's because of the the um, circulation pattern of the Pacific Ocean. If you look at the, the diagram on the screen, it moves in this like gyre format, G-Y-E-R. Um, there's another patch that has formed near Asia. Um, and again, it's these, these gyre or gyre currents that pull the trash towards this like vortex. It's kind of like a... Um, it's kind of like a, a slow moving water tornado where the water gets pulled towards the center. So what that means is that whether um, trash ends up in the ocean in Alaska or California or the west coast of Mexico or Ecuador or Chile, um, it's kind of like slowly float towards this middle rotating gyre of the um, Pacific Ocean. 
and we end up with a um, Texas sized patch of trash. Okay, I'm going to run through this quickly. Um, eight types of aquatic pollutants. For the most part, um, these are pretty straightforward. Um, number one, pathogens. Pathogens are diseases. So anything that causes disease, um, they're often found in water. Like that's why we wouldn't just go to a lake and fill up a cup of water and drink from it because it's very likely filled with pathogens. Number two, organic matter. Um, mostly we think of feces as the, the biodegradable organic matter of, of organisms. So like dead organisms that are decomposing would be organic matter. Um, poop would be organic matter. Um, organic chemicals. Um, so these would be fertilizers. Um, notice the term organic here just refers to carbon based. I don't mean organic as in like, like, you know, has the organic sticker on it. Inorganic chemicals. So these would be chemicals that are non carbon based. So things like metals. Toxic chemicals. Um, these are generally metals, but things that um, uh, bioaccumulate or end up in our uh, fat tissue and end up causing neurological or developmental issues. Physical agents, so suspended solids, um, any like like uh, soil uh, ending up in a waterway could be a type of pollution because it can cause sedimentation, it can block sunlight. Thermal pollution, which we've already discussed, but um, when water is heated, uh, that causes problems and that, that is a uh, type of pollution. And then lastly, radioactive waste. Um, so whether it's coming from a power plant or defense facility, if radioactive waste ends up in a waterway, that would clearly be a type of aquatic uh, pollution. Sorry, I didn't define aquatic. Aquatic means of the water or, or based on water. Okay, moving on to um, how we test for pollutants, particularly water pollutants. Um, basically, it can happen both indirectly or directly. Indirect water testing, um, a great example of this is indicator species. Um, certain species of organisms are very tolerant to pollution. Some species of organisms are very intolerant to pollution. So by um, surveying or even catching different species, a lot of times scientists use macroinvertebrates, which are large um, insects and worms and you know creatures without a backbone that live uh, in, in rivers and waterways. And based on the type of species that you do or don't find, you can come up with a basically a calculation of how healthy or unhealthy the waterway is. Um, similarly, scientists can find biotic in indices or indexes. Um, we'll get into this a little more detailed later on, um, but looking at diversity of species, abundance of species, as I mentioned, the tolerance levels of pollution of the biological things that live in an area can be a nice indicator of the, the health of an ecosystem. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can directly or more um, more objectively test the pollutants in a waterway by looking at uh, things like biological oxygen demand. Um, this is gonna this this is a concept that gets tricky. Students often um, mix this up with dissolved oxygen, but BOD and DO are actually not only are they different, but they're also often opposite. So. DO or dissolved oxygen is pretty straightforward. That's how much oxygen is in the waterway. Generally speaking, more oxygen means uh, higher health. Um, less oxygen means uh, either A, there's less plants in the aquatic area because when plants photosy photosynthesize, they give off oxygen. Or maybe it means eutrophication has, occur has occurred um, and it's a dead zone. But BOD, biological oxygen demand, is the measurement of how much DO is needed by bacteria or decomposers to break down organic material. Um, so basically what that is, is the, the, the idea of if, if a waterway is completely free of pollution, the BOD would be zero because if there's no pollution, it means there's no need by decomposers for oxygen to break down organic material. Now, if there's a lot of pollution um, in a waterway, that means the BOD is going to be high because there's going to be a higher demand for oxygen by those aerobic decomposers uh, to break down the organic waste. 
other direct tests, um, and these we don't really need to define, they're pretty straightforward. Fecal coliform, keyword there is fecal. Um, coliform is uh, colonies of bacteria, so you can grow, you can basically test for how much poop is in the water by doing a bacteria test. Um, pH test is obviously a, a very direct test. You put a pH stick in the water and, and find the acidity. There's tests for nitrate levels, phosphate levels, um, dissolved oxygen, as I mentioned, turbidity um, looks like it's blocked but turbidity is the murkiness of the water so turbidity is the level of murkiness and then lastly conductivity um, you can do that by finding uh, the heavy metal presence in water um, this diagram sort of relates the ideas of BOD and DO so the red line is biological oxygen demand the blue line is dissolved oxygen if you look to the left of the um, point source pollution, um, we see a healthy river because we see dissolved oxygen is high, um, which is good. That means that there's plants uh, producing oxygen in the uh, river. And we see that the BOD is low because there's no pollution there. So there's, there's zero demand for oxygen from those anaerobic bacteria, those decomposers. Um, once we get organic waste uh, into the riverway, um, immediately we're going to see the BOD go up because now that there's waste, the biological oxygen demand, the demand for oxygen from these biological aerobic bacteria um, is, is high. Um, not only is it high, but they're going to start using the oxygen. So you're going to see the DO start to drop. As the DO drops, you're going to see that the biological oxygen demand from these um, uh, aerobic bacteria is going to start, start to drop as well because they basically are eating up the sewage, eating up the organic waste, so they no longer are demanding as much oxygen. Um, and then eventually we're going to see the, the pollution either dissipate or be um, decomposed, uh, metabolized by these creatures. And then that means the BOD will be low uh, and we're entering a, a healthier environment. So the DO will start to recover. Um, so I know that's a, a mouthful, but generally speaking, BOD and DO are going to be inversely related. Um, and as a reminder, students often mix these two up. So you'd want to come up with, again, either a mnemonic device or some way to kind of remember the difference between the two. There's two main ways to treat um, water after it gets used either domestically or um, for industry. Uh, the first one is wastewater treatment. So that's basically when the um, used water gets um, cleaned um, and, and made good enough to put right back into the river. This is pretty common in big cities. Um, we'll watch a video of this. It's a multi-step process uh, which involves you know technology but also the the bacterial like normal decomposers to um clean the water for us um a nice uh, uh sustainable outcome of this is that the leftover sludge basically gets reused as what's called biosolids which is a, a fertilizer um that leftover sludge is mostly human waste and um poop is full of of phosphates and nitrates which uh, plants love and so it's a nice reusable solution there um, now in Michigan we often have combined sewage and wastewater uh, it's a bit bit outdated it's when you have one main reservoir for storm and sewage water so basically you're not treating the sewage water the the treatment is that it's getting diluted because it's going in with the storm water um, and so it's it's gonna get spread out um, the problem is that when it rains a lot, uh, the reservoir fills up and the um, direction that the reservoir should empty into basically gets backlogged and then humid sewage uh, flows backwards into the lake um, or into the, the river, the waterway. Um, so if you think about like Lake St. Clair, the beaches are pretty much always closed the day after um, a storm, like in the summertime. And it's because of E. coli. And the reason why there's E. coli in the water is because human waste is um, basically going the wrong direction and flowing uh, instead of from the sewers into the reservoir, it's getting backed up and it's going from the reservoir back into the lakes. Um, and so pretty gross uh, when that happens. 
um, outdated systems, uh, but you know, got to pay a lot of money to update to a, a newer, more um, sustainable wastewater treatment. Uh, to do that, we got to raise taxes. Uh, if you're a politician and, and you're promising people that, you know, vote for me and I will raise your taxes, everyone will pay a thousand dollars more and we're going to have really great race, wastewater treatment. It's kind of hard to get elected on that platform. So, um, as far as Michigan is concerned and the Midwest, I don't I don't see uh, the immediate uh, improvement on things like uh, wastewater treatment. Um, here's the solution, which I mentioned, which costs a lot of money, separate the storm and the sewage pipes. Just a couple more random uh, bits from 4.4 before we wrap up. Remember from the beginning that lakes and rivers can be naturally eutrophic or oligotrophic. So when we talk about eutrophication as an environmental issue, we're not talking about the natural eutrophication that happens in, in rivers and lakes. We're talking about the anthropogenic eutrophication when humans cause it due to um, wastewater, nitrates, phosphates, all that extra fertilizer getting into the waterways. Another term that comes up is effluent. What is effluent? It is treated wastewater that enters back into the environment. and so. It's up to the, the country or region or county based on how clean that affluent needs to be. It's generally clean to the degree of um, safe enough to put back in the river. It's almost never cleaned to be as clean as drinking water, somewhere in between those. Last but not least, um, nitrogen and phosphorus, um, besides fertilizer, we think of fertilizer as like the main cause of eutrophication, but Soap is a big one, and so if you're ever writing about or thinking about um, domestic issues or how we can um, have a, a positive impact on, on reducing eutrophication, pretty much all the soaps that we use are high in phosphorus and phosphates. And so whether you're washing your car in the driveway or running lots of loads of laundry just for like a few clothes at one time, um, that means that excess phosphates are getting into the waterways. So using less soap, not doing laundry until you have a full load, um, not washing your car uh, with excess soap, things like that are going to reduce the amount of um, uh, the amount of phosphates that end up in waterways. Okay, um, wrapping up 4.4, and I don't think we need to um, you know redefine or, or learn about these three levels, but as a reminder, um, the three levels of pollution management are they apply for all sorts of pollution. They apply for air pollution. They apply for um, uh, oil spills. They apply for um, uh, landfills and obviously water pollution in general. Um, so what I would do is look at each level, level one, level two, level three. You can look back to 1.5 notes if you need a reminder. Um, I would come up with a specific example of each one when it comes to water pollution. Um, so what's an example of a way that we can simply prevent water pollution? Uh, what's an example, a named example, where we can reduce water pollution? And then lastly, an example where um, water pollution can be re restored or remediated. Um, and then for each one, you just want to know the, the benefits and the drawbacks. Um, you know, with level one, they tend to maybe be more expensive, but might be the best uh, environmental outcome. Um, level three uh, is probably going to be cheaper short term or cheaper up front, um, but maybe more expensive long term as sort of a last result. Um, level two is obviously going to be somewhere in between. So just a little bit of research and I would definitely come up with just some uh, named examples of how we can prevent, reduce, and lastly restore aquatic environments. All right, that is it for 4.4. Um, a lot of terminology in that unit, um, but hopefully it all made sense and ask questions when you're back at class. Bye. Okay, 8.3, um, solid domestic waste, which is a fancy ESS term for trash that comes from our houses. Got some lovely pictures of solid domestic waste. All right, so um, let's start with the problem. Like most environmental uh, issues, the problems are, are going to be pretty similar across the board. 
Solid domestic waste has increased all over the world um, in the past century, specifically the last 50 years, because first of all, we have an increased population. Um, we reached a billion uh, and then two billion and then exponentially got up to eight billion pretty quickly. Uh, increased wealth. Uh, generally, people across the earth have more disposable income than any time in history. So that simply means we have more stuff to buy. Um, when we do buy that stuff, it's getting shipped from all over the world. Uh, and so that means we're going to have more packaging, more disposable goods. Um, generally speaking, the manufacturers of goods can externalize costs by making cheap disposable um, products. And then the environmental costs of that are not paid by the company. So there's really no, no monetary advantage of making products that are biodegradable or sustainable in nature. Um, and then as a reminder, SDW, solid domestic waste are things, anything that comes from our houses, food scraps, appliances, paper, packaging, yard waste, uh, tires, electronic waste, non-solid domestic waste would be things like from construction or industrial or nuclear waste, but this uh, unit doesn't really focus on that. This shows where most of our solid domestic waste um, comes from, the sources. If you look on the right side, um, it's mostly stuff that, that we know of good places for. We know paper and paperboard can be recycled fairly easily. Food scraps and yard trimming can be um, uh, composted and turned into soil. Plastics, metals, those things can be easily recycled. And so it's really just that, that uh, upper left corner of like rubber, textiles, wood, other. So there's really, um, we, we have the capacity to reuse and um, be sustainable with a lot of this SDW. All right, so um, as we talk about trash and why it's such a problem, this is a theme of ESS that'll come up in other units. Um, it'll definitely come up in our resource and sustainability unit. And it's this, um, we live in a linear economy. Um, if you look at that top uh, uh, linear graph, we take a resource from the earth, whether it's mined from in the earth or um, grown or harvested, but we take something from the earth, we, we make it into something, we sell it, we use it, and then when we're done with it, we dump it back into the earth. Uh, so it's like we dig a hole in the earth to get the resource, we use it, and then we dump it in another hole in the earth. Let's go back to that very first video in August, the first video of the year where um, it was on, on Mother Earth, and it said she's finite, um, referring to Mother Earth as not infinite. Um, so we live in this linear economy, which clearly cannot sustain. We can't keep digging out materials from the Earth, using them, and putting them back in another part of the Earth, because we don't have unlimited resources to dig out of the Earth, and we don't have unlimited space to just toss things back into the Earth. So the idea of a circle economy um, is that we we make stuff from our stuff. Um, it, it's, it seems pretty simple on the surface. Um, obviously, if you look into the way governments and economies are, are based off of growth, there is some problems with a circular economy. But um, on its most basic scale, um, you use stuff. And when you're done with it, you turn it into other stuff. And then you don't have to keep taking from the earth. Um, so anyways, uh, the linear economy is basically a natural resource, use it, and then it ends up in the atmosphere if it gets burned or in a landfill. Whereas a circular economy, which is sometimes referred to as a closed loop economy, is basically an economy that is sustainable and restorative by intention. It relies on things like renewable energy. Um, it eradicates waste through careful design. It eradicates toxic chemicals. Um, and it's just based on the concepts of sustainability. Um, again, you can, you can look at the linear economy that we currently live in, and then the, the possibilities or the proposal of, of hopefully one day transitioning into a more circular economy. There's a really cool example of a closed loop economy in Chicago. It's a building called The Plant. Uh, they give tours. I highly recommend it if you're ever in Chicago. It's on the south side. Um, but basically, it's it's different businesses and different co-ops that are built to be um, a, a closed loop where um, the products 
of one group might be the the inputs or the starting material of another group the waste of one might be a catalyst for another so it's, it's hard to kind of follow this diagram but for example um there's uh, aquaculture there they grow tilapia the fish uh the fish poop gets sent to the tomatoes because tomatoes love fish poop as a fertilizer um when you grow the tomatoes obviously we um can sell they sell the tomatoes and then the leftover plant actually gets dried and turned into briquettes and then those briquettes uh end up being the fuel for the bakery which is up on the top floor um i know there's a a mushroom farm um mushrooms are um consumers like us and so they actually breathe in oxygen and get rid of co2 and so the mushroom farm has all this excess co2 and then that gets pumped over to the brewery um, because beer has co2 in it and so the co2 from the mushrooms actually gets sent into the tap lines for the beer um, and so it's just all these like really cool examples now obviously when i used to go to the plant to buy products uh it would be much more expensive and so as a consumer you have to be willing to uh spend a premium if you want products that were built based on a circular economy instead of the cheaper disposable linear economy uh, you're definitely going to pay more for it and so um on a small scale this seems to work um obviously scaling it up to an entire city or country is going to be a, a pretty huge uh uh advent um and we really need to change like the way that uh success is measured right now we generally measure market success as growth um you know if a company grows the stock price goes up whereas um there would need to be a fundamental shift where um, a company being more sustainable would cause the stock price to go up but i don't know enough about markets to how sustainability could lead to profits um so obviously there there are some i think flaws with the circular economy and capitalism in general um stuff that's kind of above my knowledge maybe one of you guys can can solve that and uh save the world all right back to the content where does our solid domestic waste go there's basically four places it can end up in a landfill a recycle plant compost or an incinerator an incinerator is uh basically a place that burns trash um pause the video right now and brainstorm pros and cons of each i think you can do this uh my guess is you can do this before i tell you so pause the video try to think of one benefit and one drawback of each of these um outputs of our waste or each of these uh ending uh locations okay starting with landfills the pro is that they're generally harmless it's just a big pile of trash um and it's it's we try to put them away from people away from um uh environmentally sensitive areas and they it's just a big pile of trash it's really not that bad um now it does use space um they're ugly uh and they smell bad and so those would be the main drawbacks recycling um you get new materials for the next product um it can be a part of a closed loop economy which is a great thing um recycle plants are really expensive um we generally don't recycle uh for any economic benefits um and in like a state like michigan where we get our electricity on coal if you're running a recycle plant that recycle plant is running on coal energy so to build a new sustainable product we're burning coal to get the electricity so that new product really isn't even sustainable so that's obviously a big problem in places like michigan that rely on coal or most of the united states for that uh, matter okay compost uh it's 100 sustainable you turn trash into soil and that soil gets used um it takes a lot of effort um i've composting is actually really hard um i used to think it was just like you throw food scraps in a pile and it turns into soil but it's actually more complex than that i've tried and failed at, at more compost uh um piles than i've succeeded at believe it or not um and a lot of waste actually can't be easily composted and so it's not really a solution for all of our sdw all right last but not least incineration um the best uh benefit of this is that it reduces space because when you burn the trash the trash is now gone 
but where did that trash go? Remember that matter cannot be created or destroyed. So even though the trash is physically like no longer here, it's now up in the atmosphere. Um, and so the biggest drawback of incineration is pollution. Um, when you burn that trash, all the toxins and all the chemicals in that trash are now in the atmosphere. Um, and it smells really bad, it smells worse than a landfill. Um, of these four options, where does most of our solid domestic waste go? Mostly to landfills and then to incinerators. Um, incineration is not that popular in this country. Part of the reason is that our country has a ton of land. The United States is huge. Um, even think about a state like Michigan, where um, we're, we're packed into a few different metropolitan areas, and then we just have a ton of open land, and so we have space for landfills. In a lot of um, LEDCs, incineration happens because you can do it at your house. So if you think about it, if you didn't have like a trash service, if you didn't have a trash truck come to your house once a week and take away your trash, you wouldn't really have a good option for your trash, and so you would most likely burn it. And so incineration is actually the most popular um, output for trash in LEDCs or in small countries that don't have room for landfills. Okay, so what determines the fate of our SDW? So what determines like why um, Sweden basically recycles like all of their trash um, and whatever they don't recycle, it basically gets composted. Like Sweden doesn't even have landfills. Um, the United States is filled with landfills. Um, why was it that China was taking our trash for decades um, until 2018 and then they abruptly stopped? Um, there's all different reasons of, of what countries and societies choose to do with their solid domestic waste. Um, first one, just being culture. Um, again, the reason why Sweden recycles and composts everything is because the people of Sweden have decided that they care about that and therefore they elect leaders that um, promise to recycle and compost. And in this country, that's definitely not in the um, top of the list of things people care about, where their trash goes. Uh, economics, um, for example, why do LEDCs do some, so much incineration? Because they can't afford um, modern sustainable landfills, they can't afford recycling. Um, MEDCs often export their e-waste to LEDCs because e-waste can be valuable, but it's very environmentally hazardous. Um, so the LEDCs are willing to take those environmental risks um, and, and potentially make money from um, reusing those e-waste. Technology is a big part of this. Um, again, a lot of European countries invest uh, heavily in sustainable methods of uh, dealing with trash. Um, there's been some new technological advances of getting rid of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So that would be an example of like, you know, changing the fate of a, a pile of trash the size of Texas out in the Pacific Ocean. And then, of course, politics. Um, so think about on a local level, uh, you know, your city might incentivize uh, recycling or it might fine um, uh, uh, people who who have too many trash cans um, or uh, maybe citizens demand compost. So they elect a mayor who's all about compost. And so, you know, politics can definitely determine where or where our SDW ends up. All right, a little bit more about landfills. Um, so landfills uh, are, are more complex than just a big pile of trash. Um, they're generally um, lined and um, topped uh, so they're surrounded by clay, um, and then they have um, containment facilities that will actually collect the the like juice that comes out of the landfills. And anyways, that juice is known as leachate. Um, so if you think about like it's kind of gross, but if you think about your your trash can, if you like squeezed your trash can, um, juice would come out, and uh, that trash juice is called leachate. Uh, the collect the collect collection pipes are what uh, channel the leachate. And so basically you have the trash here and then you have pipes and then you have the leachate ending up here. Um, the landfill are almost always uh, surrounded by clay. Um, we'll learn all about clay in our soil unit, but clay is uh, very, very small particles, meaning water cannot easily get through clay. And so by lining a landfill with clay, it keeps all of the leachate, the trash juice, uh, 
contained and out of the groundwater or the, the local waterways. And then lastly, by covering the landfill with clay, it seals the waste in. Some problems with landfills. Um, first of all, incomplete decomposition. So a lot of materials will eventually biodegrade, but some things like plastics uh, take hundreds of thousands of years. Glass takes a really long time. Uh, rubber tires, I don't think, degrade in any reasonable time frame. Um, so the fact that uh, a lot of the materials in landfills just stay there. Um, methane gas. As things break down, um, methane is released. Uh, first of all, methane is flammable, so it can be locally dangerous, um, but also it's a greenhouse gas. It um, is 20 times more powerful than CO2, and so it can actually uh, lead to climate change. Um, on the other end, methane is an energy source. It can be used for, for energy, and so there are ways to actually harness that methane um, decomposition. Uh, and then lastly, settling. So uh, as things do decompose, landfills will actually take up less space because if, you know, as things are decomposing, it means they're basically breaking down into carbon dioxide and methane and those things are going into the atmosphere. And so what that means is that there's less physical space as a solid. And so things like, um, you know, playgrounds or golf courses uh, tend to go on top of landfills, which is great. But then as the materials are breaking down, those things can actually sink into the earth. Uh, sorry, one more, uh, contamination of surface or groundwater from leaching. So if there's issues with the clay liner or the collection pipes, um, that trash juice can get into waterways, which is obviously a problem. Uh, a couple examples here, uh, settling. So you have like a building that's on top of a landfill and you see where the stairs were. Um, and as the, the trash is decomposing, the earth is literally sinking, which can be an issue um if you've built something on top of the landfill uh and then we got a lovely uh uh action shot of leachate all right so again if you go over to europe uh their landfills are pretty impressive um the technology's there uh in the united states we're just not willing to really invest in that stuff um in terms of comes from tax dollars uh and it's not popular to raise taxes so first of all they're uh they're cited uh, up high on stable ground above the water table. So by keeping landfills um, just higher than, than the surrounding area, you can basically control using gravity where that leachate is gonna end up. Um, you contour the ground, basically build like curved contoured channels so you can steer the leachate into a specific um, collection pond that's away from rivers, lakes, oceans, things like that. Um, the landfill is surrounded by monitoring wells, so if there ever is leachate detected in the surrounding area, um, it can be alerted and fixed right away. Um, so again, a modern landfill, it's going to be higher up. You're going to have uh, the groundwater monitoring wells. You're going to have the leachate collection system. Uh, you'll still have the clay liner like always. And then notice in the middle, I didn't uh, mention that, but methane gas recovery system. So instead of just letting that methane gas drift out into the atmosphere, um, you can try to actually contain it um, and then sell it or use it uh, to, to um, heat your house or to run your, um, your gas stove. Uh, there's a lot of uses for methane. Um, some of the benefits of waste to energy. So the methane that I was talking about, um, if we use our uh, waste and convert it into methane or convert it into fuel. Um, first of all, it replaces landfill volume. Um, secondly, we don't need to keep digging and mining and um, drilling for fossil fuels because we can basically get a fossil fuel or a, a mimic of a fossil fuel from our trash. Um, and then the extra uh, residue can actually be captured. So similar systems to like the scrubber that I mentioned uh, in 1.5, uh, the fly ash can be captured so it doesn't end up in the environment. Um, of course, there's some drawbacks, though. So, uh, you know, if you're burning trash, you're burning trash. There's going to be air uh, odors. There's going to be air pollution because of that. Um, to do this the right way, it's going to be expensive. Again, LEDCs might do a, um, a rudimentary version of this. But um, again, like the European models of waste to energy are fairly expensive. Um, 
And then lastly, you need to be really careful that you're not burning like really hazardous, dangerous uh, waste. And so um, it's going to take time and energy to sort out and make sure that you're not burning any hazardous waste when you're attempting to turn landfill trash into usable energy. Um, so here's an example of this. So this is, is different from like the methane collection wells, which allows trash to naturally decompose. You slowly collect the methane. This would be more like a sustainable way to incinerate, where getting energy from waste, you burn the waste, um, you boil water in a steel drum, and then that turns a turbine. The turbine's connected to a generator. The generator then converts that mechanical energy to electricity. Um, and then, uh, as sustainably as possible, you collect all of the fumes and the exhaust, and you can basically scrub them, filter them. You're going to get the solids that can be buried in the ground. It might have some industrial purposes, um, but basically, um, this this can be done fairly uh, successfully, fairly sustainably. Okay, uh, limiting SDW. So just how do we have less of it? Um, how do we have less trash? Um, you guys all heard about the three R's. Uh, there's sort of a fourth R that I've, I, I don't think it's officially an IV, but I've heard about the fourth R in the last recent years. So I wanna make sure you guys aren't left out. Uh, so first of all, reduce. Um, use less, buy less, create less waste. Number two, reuse, buy reusable products. Um, stop living in our linear throwaway society. Take, use, throw it away, take, use, throw it away. And then lastly, recycle, um, you know, melt down items, uh, chop up items, rebuild them into new items. This can be done with glass, plastics, metal, and paper. And then the fourth R uh, is respond. So the idea of respond deals with education. So we respond to the issue by educating citizens, creating awareness and concern. Um, take a second, which of these three R's, so forget about respond for right now, which of the three R's is least helpful and why? I would say without a doubt, recycling is the worst of the three R's. Um, we often think of recycling as like doing our part, um, but think about it. If you buy a 24 pack of bottled water and you drink two a day, so after 12 days, you've tossed 24 plastic bottles uh, into the recycle bin. First of all, the amount of material to make those 24 plastic bottles um, Plastic comes from oil, so oil was drilled for it. Um, they were manufactured. Uh, that's a pretty industrious process. It's environmentally harmful. And then we send it to the recycle plant and we have to burn coal uh, and run heavy machinery to turn it back into another plastic water bottle that's gonna be bought and discarded. Um, so if you can avoid recycling, obviously recycling is better than littering um generally better than than throwing out but i could even argue that a landfill might be less harmful than recycling because if i throw a plastic bottle into a landfill it just sits there forever um and in this country we have enough space for that but if i throw a plastic bottle into a recycle bin and now we need to burn coal to run the recycle plant you could argue that recycling might be worse than throwing out um, i know it's a controversial take but without a question, reducing and reusing are environmental no-brainers um, by just using less stuff or buying reusable stuff. So my um, water bottle is made out of hard plastic. Um, obviously this comes from oil, just like any other plastic, but this only needs to be manufactured one time. I've had this water bottle for over a year. Um, it's, it's made once, whereas if I were to buy plastic bottles every day, like, like disposable, um, even if I'm recycling, I'm still going through a lot of material. Um, so anyways, the four R's. All right, how do we make recycling better? Um, incentivize it. Pay as you throw. So charge residents money for trash. Mandatory recycling, meaning you can find people. Um, and, and this is contradictory to my last, my last slide, I was uh, being hyperbolic to some degree because I want you guys to think about both sides of the issue. But um, let's say we are not in Michigan where we burn coal. Let's say that we live in California and our energy comes from solar and wind uh, and hydroelectricity. 
So then a recycle plant is great because a recycle plant is running on the sun. It's not causing environmental damage. So it is beneficial to recycle. But anyways, how do we then improve recycling in California? Um, incentivize it. So either charge people for trash, uh, pay them for recycling, both. Uh, make it convenient. Um, in areas where uh, curbside recycling gets picked up, uh, residents recycle at much higher rates. In areas where the residents need to go to a recycle facility, uh, it happens at a much lower rate. And then involve local businesses. Um, get businesses on board with recycled programs and, and you see benefits from that right away. Uh, here's the example of the pay as you throw. Um, I have neighbors across the street from me that they're like this middle house where I, they have two kids just like my wife and I and I have no idea how they produce that much trash. They have like four trash cans, five trash cans a week. It's crazy to me. Um, but anyways, I think it's kind of unfair that they, I produce one trash can a week, they produce five trash cans a week. So they're five times more costly to the environment in terms of the space used in a landfill. Uh, so I don't think it's fair that we pay the same amount of taxes and we pay the same amount for trash services. To me, it seems like they should pay five times as much as me. Um, so this would be an example of that pay as you throw where that house in the middle gets charged 50 bucks. Um, the house on the left gets charged 10 and then the house on the right that's doing a great job recycling and compost. They don't have to pay anything. Or you could even go further where the house on the right actually gets a monetary incentive. They're given $10 um, to do that. A little bit more about recycling the different codes one through seven. Um, you can you don't need to know this for class. I'm not going to quiz you on the uh, polyethylene terephthalate. Uh, but anyways, uh, you see the different codes, what they're used for, and then it's kind of interesting, the recycled uses. So different things that are often made of recycled products. And last but not least, for your own knowledge, um, try your best to avoid three, six, and seven. Those things are just harder to recycle. They're made of plastics that are less likely to be accepted at municipal recycling. One, two, four, and five tend to be the ones that are easily recycled. Okay, that's it. That's it for 8.3. And that is it for our topic nine on uh, waste and pollution and how to solve it. Uh, don't forget about those three levels of pollution management. Those are probably the key throughout. Um, and of course, um, ask questions uh, when we're back in class. All right, great job. Bye.